What does the book of Genesis tell us? What mysteries does it reveal? Does it tell us how we got here? Or how long we've been here? Does it tell us who we are? Or why we're so different from each other? What does it say about marriage and gender? How does it explain evil and suffering? What does a book about where we're from say about where we're going? How does a book about beginnings reveal what's to come? Well, good morning once again, Bell Shoals family. Those of you with us here in our Brandon campus and certainly wanna welcome all of you who are joining us online today as we continue in a new teaching series for 2023 called Beginnings, where we're walking through the opening chapters of the book of Genesis and really the opening chapters of human history. Last week, we talked about the first days and today, we will talk about the first people and God's creative activity on the sixth day. And on the sixth day, as we will see, God created mankind. And, and it's interesting as we think about God's creation of mankind in relation to God's creation of the animals that he made, on a previous day, because there are many today that make no distinction between animals and humans. And I know many of you have pets that you're fond of. We really could divide Bell Shoals into two categories, dog people and cat people. Dog people are those who are walking with the Lord. Cat people are those <laughs> who are... Um, we used to say backslidden, right? Um, and, and I actually came across um, a, a photo years ago of, of uh, like, I don't know, a transformation of dog owners who grew to look more like their dogs. I don't know if you've seen this. Let me, let me show it to you. It's like a conglomerate here of like people who look like their dogs. I don't know if I should say dogs that look like their owners. Um, but uh, maybe that's a real thing. I don't know. Like those of you who have pets and you love your pet, maybe you become more like them in some way or they become more like you. But um, certainly there are many of us who, who love our pets and we love animals and certain animals. But the question today really is, are there key differences between people and animals, right? Like are there, are there fundamental differences between human beings that God created on day six and other life forms that God created prior. There are many people today who say there is no difference. Julian Huxley of the American Humanist Association said this, I use the word humanist to mean someone who believes that man is just as much a natural phenomenon as an animal or a plant that his body, mind, and soul were not supernaturally created, but are products of evolution, and that he is not under the control or guidance of any supernatural being or beings, but has to rely on himself and his own power. Joseph Crutch said, there is no reason to suppose that man's own life has any more meaning than the life of the humblest insect that crawls from one annihilation or another. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I see no reason for attributing to man a significance different in kind from that which belongs to a baboon or a grain of sand. And so there are many people today, a growing number of people today who suggest that there really is no distinction in essence or significance between animals, some would even say plants, and human beings. And so we need to probe into that issue today as we look at these opening pages of human history and ask the question, are human beings chemical phenomenon or created persons? 
Are we created in God's image or is God simply a creation of our imagination? You see, the answer to these questions fundamentally determine the direction of your life. If you believe that you are here as an accident of the cosmos, as an unintended consequence, if you believe that you are here today with no distinction in essence, significance, or purpose from an animal or a plant or a grain of sand, that will have fundamental implications for not only how you view yourself, but how you live your life. And so I want you to know today as we come to these opening pages of human history that I believe you are more than an unintended consequence of the cosmos. I believe that every single one of you are more than just an accident and an extension of an evolutionary process on a macro level that brought us to existence out of some type of animal life and ultimately some type of cosmic spark that we cannot understand. No, I wanna show you today what I believe to be true, what I believe takes the least amount of faith to believe, and that is you are here because of the divine act of a loving God who created you unique, special, and in his image. And so every single one of you as human beings, every single one of you as men and women have a unique, purpose in this world, and you are deeply loved by the God who made you. We, we see the, the description of God's creative activities relates not just to the cosmos that we reviewed last week, but specifically now to human beings, which are the crowning jewel of God's creation activity. We see something unique happening here when we look at God's creation of mankind. We, we see it in Genesis 1, beginning in verse 26, after God has made everything else, here on the last day of his creative power, here's what happens. God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And they will reign over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. And so this is huge. A foundational statement, God created human beings in his own image. Did not create any of the animals in his own image. Did not create any of the birds in his own image. Did not create any of the fish in his own image. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And then God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth that, and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and all the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life, and that is what happened. And then God looked over all that he had made and saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came. And that was the sixth day. Now the sixth day is a special day because on the sixth day, God created mankind. In his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God gave them direction on how to lead, how to govern, how to care for the world that he made and placed them in. And so today I want us to consider the uniqueness of man, the uniqueness of mankind, the uniqueness that human beings possess. And I, and I just wanna remind you today as to some of the reasons that you are so special and you are so loved. Despite what many are saying throughout our society, I want you to see today why human beings are different in essence and significance and why we need to take our lives so seriously and view them so preciously. First of all, I want you to see that you have a unique dignity. 
Mankind has a unique dignity. I want you to see today that you possess a unique dignity that no other created being possesses. As I said a moment ago, you are not an accident. You are not an unintentional consequence of the cosmos. No, on the sixth day, God created mankind. And he created mankind with a unique dignity. There is something different about us. There are two reasons for this. First of all, we see that we are created in God's image. Now this is huge. The fact that we are created in God's image means that we have both a higher level of consciousness than any other created being and we have a conscience which means we have the moral and spiritual capacity within us to know and relate to God and to contemplate eternity, which no other created being does. You see, we have a unique dignity. We are made in God's image. We are different in essence. We are different in conscience. And we have a higher level of consciousness. Again, there are some today who disagree with this. It's no wonder there are so many in our society who struggle with their identity when people like Michael Fox say things like this, quote, there is no clear distinction between us and the animals. Animals communicate, animals have emotions, animals can think. Some thinkers think that the human soul is different because we are immortal and that just becomes completely absurd, end quote. Many teaching today that men and women are no different than the animals. We are no different in essence or significance. I'm here to tell you that thinking is absolutely foolish. There is a huge difference between humans and the rest of the created order. And the difference is we are made to reflect God's image in the world. You see, this higher level of consciousness that we have, as I referenced last week, cannot be explained by natural or evolutionary theory. Bill Nye, as I told you last week, when asked about how humans have a higher level of consciousness than the rest of the created order, simply said, quote, I don't know, end quote. You see, animals can learn tricks, but only man can learn truth. Animals can work, only man can worship. The the, the image of God gives a unique dignity that elevates human life over all others. We have a mental and relational likeness to God. We can think, reason, and relate to others as God relates to himself in the context of the Trinity and to us. We are thinking, relational people, and we think and relate on a level not seen in the rest of the created order. And then we have a moral and a spiritual likeness to God. Again, we know things like right and wrong, We contemplate our existence. We ask questions like, how did we get here? We we wrestle within ourselves with, with, with the right and wrong that we see in our world and even within our own lives. The animals do not do this. Whenever that cheetah in the African tundra chases down a baby antelope, there is no moral crisis as he is enjoying his breakfast. The cheetah never says, what have I done? This little antelope has has a family. There's clearly a higher level of consciousness among human beings. Even evolutionary biologists acknowledge this. They just have no explanation for it. Christ followers do. We have a reasonable, rational, historical argument for the higher level of consciousness among human beings. It is simply this. We are made differently. We are made in the image of God. We reflect in our biology. We reflect in our mental capacity. We reflect in our moral capacity the very glory of God who created us. That's why we are different. That's why we have a higher level of consciousness. That's why we have a conscience. That's why we contemplate morality and things like eternity because we are created in God's Image. We are made to know God, to reflect God, to relate to God. The animals are not. And so human life is precious. Human life is significant. We ought to view human life differently. We ought to protect human life. 
diligently because it is sacred and precious. Only human beings bear the image of God. This is not to suggest, of course, that we be abusive of other life that God has made, that we mistreat the world in which we are placed. No, we will see here that that's actually the opposite of what God's charged us to do. But it is to suggest that we understand there is a purpose to our lives that is only rightfully and reasonably explained by the creative power of God, who made us to reflect him, to know him, and to enjoy him forever. You see, you have a unique dignity. You are created in God's image. Secondly, I just want you to see related to your dignity that you are created with one of two genders. Now, not only are we created in God's image, we are created with two genders. I just want to highlight here what the scripture says, that not only are we created in the image of God, but we are created male and female. You see, our biology reflects God's glory. Men and women are equal in essence and significant because both bear the image of God. There is no distinction among men and women when it comes to significance, when it comes to essence. We are different by design in certain ways, but our differences are designed to complement each other. Now our society is blurring these lines as well. Many saying that our lives are no different than other life forms on planet earth, other animal life or plant life. And then of course, there's a growing movement that tells us that our identity is not tied to our biology, it's tied more to sociology and therefore you can be whoever you wanna be in terms of your gender. Slate Magazine said recently, gender is a kind of performance, something we actively create from the limited cultural materials we encounter. Therefore, babies and toddlers are genderless. A growing movement, of course, within our society that tells parents they should not assign a gender to their babies. They should allow their babies to grow and then to decide for themselves whether or not they are a man or a woman. Now, I'm no medical doctor, but I can tell you this. Anyone in a delivery room knows that babies are not genderless. If you have questions as to why we know these things to be true, email Jason Millsaps. Our lead worship pastor, jason.millsaps at bellshoals.com. He will explain to you why we know that babies are not genderless. <laughs> babies are not genderless. They are not genderless physically. They are not genderless biologically. There, there are hardwired within us as men and women, differences that reflect God's glory and the beauty of his design. Again, differences are not differences in essence or significance, but are differences in function. We are made to complement each other. We are made to benefit each other and to to, um, subdue the earth together. You see, this is the beauty of God's design. And for those who are suggesting today that gender is just a social construct and that your identity can be whatever you want it to be, are leading us into gross dysfunction. Because there is substantive biology tied to our identity. For example, just foundationally, human Beings, as men and women, possess different chromosomal patterns. I actually mentioned this recently, but human females possess two X chromosomes in their 23rd pair of chromosomes, while males possess an X and a Y. Hardwired in every cell of our bodies is a biological construct that screams man or woman. Hardwired in our DNA. This minor variation is what differentiates males from females on a genetic level, and it gives rise to massive biological and hormonal differences. There was a University of Southern California professor recently who wrote an article, a secular article, on the different health risks for men and women with COVID. 
Here, here's what the professor said. Quote, it is likely that true biological differences between men and women, especially in the immune system, may underlie the differences in relative risk. Indeed, accumulating research suggests that there are fundamental differences in male and female immune systems which arise from genetic or hormonal influences, end quote. What this professor is articulating is that men and women are biologically different. Immune systems respond differently. Hormonal patterns are different. We, we are different by design. There are differences in skeletal structures. Men typically have larger and stronger bones in terms of size and density. Men have um, bigger heads, but smaller brains. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, uh, typically larger skeletal structure, uh, longer arms and legs. I'm not sure about the brain piece. I'll let you decide. <laughs> Men typically, I've told you this before, have a longer ring finger while women have a longer index finger. Women have longer torsos and their skeleton accommodates extra reproductive organs with space to reorganize during pregnancy, which is an amazing thing and an aspect of womanhood that reflects the beauty of God's design. You see over and over and over again, as we look at the facts, as we look at the evidence, what we find is that men and women are not the same. There's not one better than the other. Both are equal in essence and significance. But it means something to be a man and it means something to be a woman. And we should not devalue that. It, it means something to be a husband. It means something to be a wife. It means something to be a father. It means something to be a mother. And I know this is not a family series, but we'll see a little bit of this next week in terms of God's design. But so let me give you a little heads up. Children need a father and a mother. They need both, right? Children need a father and a mother. They need a mom and a dad. This is God's design, right? That a man and a woman come together biologically. I'm amazed that in our society, it's becoming more accepted that you can be a birthing person of either gender. And these same people would chide and rebuke us for believing that there's a God who created human beings in his image. They would say, well, consider the evidence. But yet when we turn to the evidence biologically for who can have children, we are scolded yet again and said, well, no. A birthing person can be anyone who claims they are. And when you email Jason, he will tell you, <laughs> men do not have babies. <laughs> Biological men do not have babies. And, and so I just, want, I just want to say clearly today, all of this deviation from God's design in our world is leading to a lot of dysfunction. And just make a note of this, whenever you deviate from God's design for your life, it will put you in a place of greater dysfunction. In any area, but I'm telling you, when you begin, as our society is, to mess with the fabric of who we are, it has disastrous consequences. And I understand there are people who struggle with same-sex attraction, they struggle with uh, a part of their identity. I, listen, I'm sensitive to that. I respect that. I, totally, I, I get that. It, let's just be honest, okay? We, we value aggressive authenticity here at Bell Shoals. And so let's just keep it real. All of us struggle with something. There are no perfect people here at Bell Shoals. There are no men and women here that don't struggle with some temptation, some desire that's not healthy, some crisis, right? There, there, there's never been a single one of us in the room today or who's watching us online today. None of us, okay, can look back on our lives and say, oh yeah, there was this season, I didn't struggle with anything at all. We all struggle with certain things. And there are some people who struggle with their identity, who struggle with their attractions sexually, who struggle with 
um, who they want to spend the rest of their life with, right? And they, that's a real struggle. You know why? Because as we're going to see in a couple of weeks, we are fallen, broken people in a fallen, broken world, and we have desires and attractions that do not always match those that are best for us. And it's important as a church that we recognize, that we understand. Just because someone else's struggle does not match ours, does not make them less of a human. And so, on the one hand, we recognize that there are people who struggle. And there are people who have legitimate uh, temptations. And many are fighting that and trying to honor the Lord. But it's difficult. It's, 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 it's a tough thing. And, and if we're honest, we're all struggling with something. So, so here's the thing. It's, I'm not speaking to the struggle. I'm not speaking to the brokenness within us. We all have it. Here's what I'm saying. The solution to our brokenness is never denying the reality of who God has made us to be. And whenever you, right, yeah, hold on. whenever you stop pushing back against these unhealthy desires and temptations and you start accepting them and making excuses for them, you put yourself in a place where you will never have the fulfillment God's created you to have. And what our society is doing is making these sweeping statements related to not only how the world was made and what that means for us and how human beings are the same as every other life form and then as it relates to our identity that we can be largely whoever we want to be, men or women or anything else and, and birthing persons and the rest. And what we're saying is, well, if, if, if you just lean into these unhealthy appetites and desires, well, then you will find true happiness and true fulfillment. And what the data shows us is that is absolutely a lie. You will actually only have true meaning, purpose, and fulfillment when you lean into God's design. And so we understand the struggle, but we hold firm in the truth because, as Jesus said, it's the truth that sets us free. Now, here's the truth you are not an accident. You are not an unintended consequence. You have a unique dignity. Your unique di dignity relates to the fact that you're made in God's image morally, spiritually mentally, relationally, you are made to reflect the glory of God and you are made as a male or a female to reflect his glory and to find your identity there. And as you function in the world as a man or a woman, a husband or a wife maybe, a father or a mother, and as you function in these ways in God's image, you will find fulfillment as you lean into his love, his power, his glory. This is God's design. This is our dignity. It's a unique dignity no other created being has. All right. Secondly, make a note of this. You also have a unique dominion. You have a unique dominion. God says that he will create man, mankind, men and women in his image. He did so in his image, male and female, he created them. But then notice he blessed them. He tells them to be fruitful and multiply. We'll talk about that next week in terms of his design for men and women and family. Fill the earth. And then he uses a word here, govern it. Exercise dominion over it. Here's the second aspect of this, this uh, amazing creation in terms of human beings. Not only do we have a unique dignity, we have a unique dominion. We are created, literally that word dominion means to reign or to rule. We, it's a very strong word. We're, we're made to govern the rest of the created order that God has made. We have a responsibility to care for the world in which we are placed and to ensure that God's design is carried out. Listen, this, again, is an aspect of God's created power that elevates human life, that, 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 that gives us a glimpse of our preciousness, the fact that God has made us to reflect him, to know him, but also then to govern the rest of what he has made. And that's precisely what, he, what he's done. King David in Psalm 8 said this. I love this. He says, when I look at the night sky and I see the work of, of, um, of your fingers, the, the moon and the stars that you set in place, he's, he's just overwhelmed by this. What? What are we, like mere mortals, that, that you should think about them, human beings, that you should care for them? Yet, look at what David says here about you and me, our elevated dignity and dominion. He says, you made them just a little lower than God. You crowned them with glory and honor. You put them in charge or gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all of the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. We have dominion. 
there is a difference between human life and the rest of the created order. We have a unique dignity. We have a unique dominion responsible to govern the world and to subdue it and to carry out God's design for it. And then finally, I just want you to see here, because you are created in God's image with a unique dignity and a unique dominion, you also have a unique destiny. As I said, the fact that we are made in God's image means that we contemplate eternity, what happens beyond death. We ask questions like, how did we get here? We have this internal conscience that tells us something about our lives. We, 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 we're made to live forever. L listen, here's the truth. Everyone lives forever somewhere. You see, there was a time you were not, but there will never be a time you will not be. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, God has made everything beautiful for its own time and he has planted eternity in the human heart. Ecclesiastes 12 says this, yes, remember your creator now while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed and the spring and the pulley is broken at the well, for then the dust will return to the earth, but the spirit will return to God who gave it. Scripture says, it is appointed for man to die and then the judgment. And every single person made in the image of God is made to live forever. We have not just bodies, we have souls. And, and that soul is reflective of the fact that we have a higher level of consciousness and we have a conscience that God's given to us whereby we can know him, relate to him. And, and as the scripture says, it's, it's eternity. God's planted eternity in our hearts. One day our bodies, like dust, will return to the earth, but our spirit will return to God. And so, and so here's, here's the thing. There is something unique about you. You, are, you have unique dignity. You have unique dominion. And you have a unique destiny. God's made you to live forever with him. Now the problem is this image of God in us is marred. It's tarnished. It's broken. Well, it's there, don't get me wrong, it's there, but it's marred, it's tarnished because of sin. And, and so I, I, I just have to mention here as we contemplate our unique dignity, I just want you to understand that, listen, that's why Jesus came. Jesus came as the true perfect image of God to bring healing and forgiveness of sin so that we can be fully restored to God's image in us and thus spend eternity in heaven. And Jesus didn't come and die for animals. Some of you are wondering, will my pet be in heaven with me? Jason Millsaps at bellshoals.com. <laughs> Let me just say, listen, Jesus didn't come and die for the animal world. Jesus didn't come and die for the plant world. Jesus didn't come and die for the marine world. He came and he died for you and me. For men and women created his image, but whose image is marred because of their sin and rebellion. But God in his infinite love and mercy came at his own initiative and he sent Jesus who as the son, the second member of the Trinity is the perfect image of God. And Jesus came and did for us what we could not do for ourselves so that through faith in Jesus, we have forgiveness and the restoration of this image in us. 2 Corinthians 4 says this, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it's hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message, this message about the glory of Christ, who, look at this, is the exact likeness or image of God. And there are people all around the world today whose eyes are blind. They can't see the glory of God. It's there, and it's there in Jesus, who is the image of God, who has come to restore the image of God in us. And I just want you to know today you have unique dignity, you have a unique dominion, and you have a unique destiny. And the only way for your soul to be eternally comforted with the peace of God's presence forever and ever and ever is to turn from your sin and to look to Jesus 
the image of God who restores the broken image in us. And Jesus came and he died for you because you have a unique dignity. (laughs) You have a unique destiny and you're made to reflect his glory. You know, that image is significant. We, we actually value that to, to a lesser degree in our society with just our currency. If you take a $1 bill or a $100 bill, the only difference on that paper is whose picture is listed on the front of it. And if you have a George Washington, that means one thing. If you have a Benjamin Franklin, that means something different altogether. And you know what's true of our currency? It doesn't matter if it's wrinkled, doesn't matter if it's a little torn, doesn't matter if it's been all crumpled up. You know what? As long as that currency has the right image on the front of it, it's still worth what it's worth. And it may be true that some of you today are like, you know, you don't you feel a little wrinkled. <laughs> I won't ask for a show of hands. You feel a little torn, you feel a little battered, you know, you feel a little crumpled up at times. Listen, the image of God in us is marred, it's tarnished, it's not perfect. But here's the beauty of what Christ has done for us. Here's what it means that we're made in God's image. We hide ourselves through faith, saving faith in Jesus for what he's done. Here's what happens. The image that we carry forward in life is as valuable to the Lord as if it were perfect. Because even though we aren't perfect, Jesus is. And just like an image on a, on, a, on a piece of currency, our lives, when they're stamped with the image of Jesus, we hide our lives in the saving grace of Jesus. Here what happens. We are valued by our Father in the same way that Jesus is valued. It doesn't matter how wrinkled you feel or how torn you are. Here's the beauty of God's saving grace. If you'll just look to him today, not only will he save you, he will restore this broken, tarnished image in you, hiding you in the image of Jesus. And he will welcome you, receive you, love you, bless you as he does his own son. Why? Because he made you in his image. He made you a male or a female to exercise dominion and to dwell with him forever. You have a unique dignity, a unique dominion, and a unique destiny. Don't miss it. 